FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz, and today's February 6th, 2018. Well, you've probably been watching the gyrations in the stock market. Bitcoin, Bitcoin's down to just $7,200 per coin. And hey, what about gold? Gold's taken a little bit of a hit this morning. Well, let's find out what's really going on in the markets. I've got Jeffrey Christian with us. Jeff, you haven't been with us in a while. You run CPM Group, and it's great to have you back on the show. Good to be here. Hey, so we saw, well, let's kind of start first with gold and Bitcoin. Uh, you wrote an article that I read basically saying that cryptocurrencies are not uh, crowding out investment in, in gold and miners. It's actually the broader market itself with its, uh, well, the Dow last year, 25% annualized return. Uh, the emerging markets, 34%. I mean, you look, stock markets in the world were just on fire. And basically, your premise is that that's what's crowding out investment in uh, mining. Yeah, you know, the old adage about uh, the bank robber who was asked why he robbed banks, he said that's where the money is. <laughs> if you look at what went on with gold, and, you know, first off, you know, gold last year on an annual average basis only rose 0.7%. But point to point from the end of 2016 to the end of 2017, gold rose 22%. That That's a pretty good return. Uh, or, I'm sorry, it rose 14%, right. which was competitive in some ways with the stock market. So you had people complaining in the gold market that the price wasn't rising faster, and yes, the gold equity markets were really devastated. Uh, but you know, we we sort of take the approach: well, where did the money go? And you're talking about a, a gold market where you have three trillion dollars worth of gold, and you have you know quite a few hundred billion dollars of new uh, purchases every year, and. You compare that to the stock market where you have $70 trillion of open interest and quadrillions of dollars of derivatives written against the stock market and billions of investors. Uh, and then on the flip side, you have the cryptocurrencies, uh, the major one of which is Bitcoin. And, but, you know, it's all opaque. Uh, but the people who are involved in, in creating and running these things suggest that there are fewer than a million people worldwide investing or speculating in them. And that at the peak in December, it was only about $750 billion of open interest, which was up from about $250 billion in the middle of last year and is down to about $300 billion now. Uh, so when you say, well, you know, where are the investors who are not investing in gold and gold equities going? Most of them probably were going into the broader market. And we saw that with the people, with the investors that we talked to, both retail investors and uh, large institutional investors. But you had a stock market that was moving from strength to strength really f since 2010. So for seven years, eight years, you had historically low volatility in the Dow Jones and the S&P. It was just marching higher and higher from record to record. Trillions of dollars, tens of trillions of dollars invested in it, quadrillions of dollars, billions of investors. That's where the money was going last year. You know, it, it's like Willie really Sutton, the, the bank robber. It, it, that's where the money was going. It wasn't, you know, there was a little bit of speculative hype that was going into bitcoins, but the vast majority of the distraction was the ever higher uh, U.S. stock market. So effectively, bitcoin cryptocurrencies, they're really a niche market at this point. They're not mainstream. Uh, it, there are certain technological requirements, knowledge that you have to have in order to get involved in the space. You don't just go online and buy 100 shares of, of Microsoft. It's a little more, you got to watch some training videos. You got to learn about wallets and exchanges. So, so really, there's a barrier there. It's not a tremendous barrier. I think anyone could learn how to deal with it. But, but still, it's very specialized. So, so the money went into the broader market. And, and now, looks like we're having a correction. We lost uh, upwards of 1,800 points in two sessions. Haven't looked at it today yet. But, but basically, 
fear has returned to Wall Street. Volatility has gone up exponentially in a little more than a couple of days. Will it stay there? Where are we heading with the market here? Well, our, you know, we're waiting for the dust to settle on the stock market right now. Our view has been that it's grossly overvalued, that uh, folks really don't understand what was going on. You know, the economy in the U.S. and on a global basis actually looks halfway decent, but there are cracks starting to appear and starting to widen. And there are major long-term issues that pose problems both for the global economy and for the stock market. So our, our view has been that the stock market probably you know, would see a, a 10% correction in the first half of this year, but dust itself off and move higher. But that by the time you get into 20, late 2018 and 2019, and then the years beyond, you could see some of these bigger economic structural problems starting to come home to roost. And that could lead to a much more uh, devastating decline in the stock market. You know, we point out the fact that if you look at the stock market, the S&P or the Dow Jones or the NASDAQ or anything else, uh, in 2000, 2001, and then again in 2008, 2009, you didn't see a 10 to 15% bear market the way stock market professionals talk about bear market, you saw a 50% decline. Now, the people who really lost money are the people who panicked and sold when stocks had fallen 40-50%. The people who stayed calm and said, I'm going to ride out this storm, within two or three years, the stock market was back where they were. And we would not be surprised to see something like a 50% decline in the stock market at some point in the future. We don't think it's going to happen in 2018. We think that this is just a temporary blip down uh, in in the stock market because people are looking around the world and saying, okay, yeah, the U.S. economy looks good, but there are some structural problems. It's not as strong as perhaps we were thinking. Uh, the tax uh, cuts that have been passed by the Congress and signed into law, that's going to help the stock market. It's not going to be particularly helpful for the U.S. economy. Uh, the infrastructure rebuild is still pie in the sky, as it has been really for the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, so it's probably not going to kick into a lot of construction in the United States. Um, interest rates are starting to rise, and that means that everything sort of has to be readjusted on relative to value basis. So I think that there are some issues there that have caused investors at this point to sort of um, take some profits. And there was a lot of nervousness in the stock market prior to this, and, and you're seeing that nervous reflection. But I think it dusts itself off. We think the bigger decline is probably two or three years away, at least, and maybe five years away. Mm -hmm. And Hey, so you're on the street, you're actively engaged with Wall Street, to, such that it is Wall Street's kind of like a term of art now. It's not really a geographical location anymore because all trading takes place, you know, at desks. It doesn't really take place on the floor of an exchange anymore. That's like a very minor part of it. I, I look at it as kind of like a backdrop or a, st a stage, a sound stage, you know, video stage for the market. But... The people that you see in the market now, a lot of younger people have gotten in in the past 10 years, nine years, who never experienced a bear market before, who really never even experienced a 10% uh, correction. What effect does that have when these things ultimately hit? I think it's a mixed picture. We've seen this before. And I think that some of the people will panic and some of the people will stay calm. Uh, you know, it's funny what you say because I worked on Wall Street physically, not on Wall Street, but you know, on Water Street and then Broad Street and then Broadway and then back to Broad Street for 38 years. And, and we were on Broad Street as CPM Group for the last 20 years. Last year, we moved. We went to a distributed workplace, and I'm working out of a, a loft in Brooklyn close to my house nowadays. So it's exactly what you say. You know, Wall Street is still a, a theoretical or a, a philosophical place, but you know, the 
Wall Street, where I worked for 38 years, is now a tourist attraction. Uh, and, and there's no need to be there. And most of the trading is done electronically. And funny, because... You know, we were watching the news last night, and they had, they show these people on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange uh, as they're talking about this enormous decline in the in the stock market yesterday. And I was like, you know, is this a sound set someplace? Because you know, who trades on the floor of the exchange anymore? Um, but you do see that, and you see it actually. It's funny in in the commodities market. If you look at the scandals that have occurred in the gold market over the last 20, 30 years, almost and and the copper market with you know Sumitomo and Kadelko, almost all of those problems occurred in the OTC market, the principal to principal dealer market. None of them actually occurred on the comments, but when one of them has occurred, the news media always shows the guys on the floor of the comments. <laughs> And they did it again last night with the stock market. You know, this is not anything that some guy on the floor of the exchange is doing. He's just fill, fulfilling orders and actually taking the other side of the trade as a market maker, perhaps. You know, uh, but yeah, we still need a visual cue, and the exchanges always get picked up as a visual cue because it's something you can show on television, even though. They often aren't the place where the uh, problems are actually occurring. Yeah, I wonder if there's really traders, if there's really financial professionals there, or whether they're extras that they hire every day to look like they're doing something. Because they're an anachronism here, and that's there's, there's part of the some problem. People there, but yeah, it's it's a fraction of what it used to be. Yeah. Yeah. So. We were we've been hearing about these algorithms. You know, there's people that there's not even people involved in buying stocks. The majority of the volume on the exchange, and the question was always, what happens when the algorithm says to sell, which it did the past couple of days. A massive rush for the exits. Does that, when the big one comes, is that going to be like sustained nonstop selling for like three weeks, where it just gets driven to oblivion? Or can this somehow be controlled? Well, there are circuit breakers, but it's very hard to control. And and you know, it, it, you know, first off, the algorithmic trading is is a, a really big issue across financial markets. But it also couples with something else, uh, which is the disappearance of market makers. Um, and if you go back to the tech stock bubble burst in, in 2001, it was very interesting because NASDAQ, which is electronic trading and was electronic trading at the time and didn't have market makers, NASDAQ fell like 86, 90 percent in that in that recession and, and stock market drop. The New York Stock Exchange, which was still almost exclusively floor trading and had market makers and professionals and, and, and people who stood to take the other side, fell about half as much, about 45 percent. Uh, in the ensuing 17 years, the New York Stock Exchange has gone electronic. So there are very few people left on the floor, uh, and most of the market makers have disappeared. That means that the stock market is much more vulnerable today than it was in 2001 and even in 2008 uh, to the kinds of drop downs. So you have circuit breakers that if it falls a certain amount, it you know, stops trading for a period of time, but that only slows things down. And you know, the regulations have been confounded by the difficulty of, uh, you know, some algorithmic trading is good and some algorithmic trading is bad, and how do you regulate away the bad algorithmic trading from the, without hurting the good algorithmic trading? And the other factor is, you know, in the, in the commodities market, something like 95% of the trades are computerized, uh, technically based trading. In the stock market, it used to be, you know, 40, 50, 60%. I have no idea what it is now, but it's probably well over 60% of the trades are computer generated. So insofar as the financial markets and trading on the wall, on the stock exchange is a major engine for generating revenues and incomes and, and high paying jobs, you really can't regulate that stuff away because these are some of the last 
big paying jobs in America. And and if you regulate them away, not only do you regulate regulate away those jobs, but you also regulate away all of the people who provide services to the people who have those high income jobs. So you know the regulators are stymied by the fact that first off you have to discriminate good trading from bad trading, which is virtually impossible yeah. uh, at this point. And the second thing is you have to take in mind that if you are not careful, you could really destroy a significant part of the U.S. economy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the extension is Brexit. You know, in England. The financial services industry, which services one, uh, not only the UK, but also Europe and the world, that's a significant portion. It's like 15, 20 percent of the UK economy. So if they're not careful with Brexit, they could really, you know, some estimates are that they could knock 10 percent off of GDP growth in the UK over the next 10 years if they're not careful with Brexit. And if those jobs leave London and go to Copenhagen or Amsterdam or Frankfurt or Paris. Yeah, well, it's a, it's an interesting world out there. I mean, you could get into the whole purpose and existence of high frequency trading, whether it should exist or not, but but more interested getting into cryptocurrencies, your take on it. So it's kind of the tail or the tip of the tail wagging the tail wagging the dog uh, but they have a future someplace here presumably the government really hasn't wanted to to crack down on them because it is an emerging growth area of the economy and it could be regulated out of existence but when you see a dip like we saw you know we lost two-thirds of the value of Bitcoin whatever it should be worth you gotta they have to wonder well we're supposed to regulate, we're supposed to protect uh, the consumer, et cetera. What do we do here? These markets are exceedingly difficult to regulate because they're so uh, easily dispersed throughout the world. I think uh, the regulators really are in a quandary about this, how they, how they just stop the outright frauds. It's, it's, it's really challenging. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be kind of jerky and go back to gold on it, but I mean, I think when we talk to market regulators and central bankers and when we read what they're writing, what we see is, and I alluded to this earlier, it's fewer than a million people, it's fewer than a trillion dollars in, in total assets even at the peak. Uh, and I think that a lot of regulators and market uh, and central banks sort of say, you know, we like the idea of digital currencies and distributed uh, ledger protocols, and those are things that we probably will be using in the future at some point. Uh, we don't necessarily like privately issued cryptocurrencies, but because it's fewer than a million people and it's, it's you know, $300 billion, we're going to let the market resolve that itself. And I'll draw the corollary back to the gold market because I, I like gold. Yeah. Um, there are people in the world who I say incorrectly continue to sit there and try to stimulate investor fears over the idea that the U.S. government might call in the gold uh, the way it did in 1933. And we keep saying that's just not going to happen because it's no longer relevant. In 1929 through 32, in the start of the Great Depression, about a third of the world's wealth was stored in gold. And when investors saw the depression coming, they took money out of the bank, they took money out of investments, and they put it into gold. And that caused uh, an acceleration of the depression. Today, gold represents about 0.5%, like half of a percent of private sector financial wealth. And if you got into a depression, Again, the idea of people rushing into gold is meaningless to the global economy. So if you talk to central bankers about gold, first off, most of them don't care to talk about gold because they see it as 
largely irrelevant. They talked to me about it because they wouldn't talk to me about it unless they were interested in it. But uh, they don't see the idea of a rush into gold in a future depression as anything that's going to have an unduly measurable negative impact on their ability to fight a depression. And they don't necessarily see the idea of calling in gold and, and, and prohibiting private ownership as uh, a, an effective tool. So in 2008-2009, no one in any central bank cared about gold. They were focusing on the currency markets and the bond markets and those parts of the private wealth, that those parts of private wealth that was that were important and that that were that were needing attention. And they kind of let gold go on its own. And the same is true, bringing it back to Bitcoins. Now, I think that central banks say, you know, cryptocurrencies uh, probably will blow up. They're the ultimate fiat currency. Not only are they not backed by anything, they're not even backed by a government. So you can't, you know, you can't go down to the Ministry of Finance or the Treasury and protest in front of it if <laughs> if they blow up. You know, you can stand around in a square in Tokyo as they have done and say, "Hey, where did all my wealth go?" Uh, and there's nobody there to complain to. Uh, so I think that you know, uh, central banks look at cryptocurrencies and they say these are the ultimate fiat currency. They're extremely speculative. But to shut them down is like to shut down casinos. Very much like shutting down casinos or, or state lotteries and saying, you know, we got, we've got a problem with addictive gambling in America. Let's shut these things down. No, we're not going to do it. It's not that important to the economy. It's not that important to the financial market. And, you know, if they blow up, they blow up and a few hundred thousand people lose money. Uh, but it's not like we're going to have hundreds of millions of people losing their pensions. Yeah. So to them, it's irrelevant. So and to them, gold is irrelevant. So as long as you brought up gold, silver, what do you see for the coming year? Because we've got this volatility going on. The volatility is probably going to stay high throughout the year. If if the January effect uh, uh, has any validity, uh, we're going to see volatility. So what's what's going to be the effect upon gold? Well, we're trying to figure out what exactly happens in the sh short, short term, like the next several days, uh, given the stock market uh, and the bond market developments. Our view is that the gold price, our view had been that the gold price could get up to 1340, 1350 in January, and that it could fall down to 1280 or 1250 even in February and March after the January effect is over. We saw, you know, 1350, we saw 1360, it's back down right now. It's about 1330, I think, as we speak. Uh, our view is that it could go back up to 1350 or so uh, over the next week or two because of the uh, volatility in the stock and bond markets, but that at some point it does come off. We think that it could come down to 1280, 1300. Uh, right now, we think 1320 is a short term support. And then we think it kind of calms down in the second quarter. In the third and fourth quarters, we think that gold prices will start rising again. And and there'll be, uh, we'll also probably see an increase in the volatility in gold prices, and that the, the increase will accelerate in the fourth quarter, will accelerate further in 2019, and you know we're on record as saying that we think that beyond 2019, into that period 2020, 2024, we would not be surprised to see gold prices rise very sharply to new record levels. Yeah. And were there any surprises for last year that you saw in the markets? They were pretty, you know, pretty sideways. The markets uh, traded in a pretty tight channel for the most part. There's some really interesting things going on. And one of the things, you know, I think it's a little bit ironic. Uh, we've seen people who bought gold out of fear, backing away from the market last year. There are any number of people who have been buying gold for years and for decades because they're concerned about the state of the economy and the idea of a, a, a real financial uh, meltdown or, you know, government problems. And, and what we saw last year was the people who bought gold for fear purposes were backing away from the market. So we saw coin sales in, in North America fall 67%. Uh, but we saw other investors 
including new investors who were new to gold coming into the gold market out of greed. You know, people who were saying, look, the stock market's moving from strength to strength, and at some point it's going to fall. Uh, and the bond market is, is, is at risk of falling. Bond prices are at risk of falling as interest rates start rising. And gold, meanwhile, is tra- trading water around 12, 1300. We think that gold is a good value investment here. So what we saw were people buying gold last year in China, in North America, and elsewhere on a capital appreciation basis, even as other people were backing away on a capital preservation basis. And I think it's a little ironic because you know, my view is that from a capital preservation basis, um, we're probably at a greater risk now than we have been since World War II. So this is exactly when we shouldn't walk away from the fear trade. But what we did see last year was people who bought gold from fear buying less gold and people who bought gold out of greed buying more gold. Yeah, that's interesting because, look, uh, the biggest problems, well, there's a lot of problems facing the country, the world, but the debt issue just keeps getting worse. So the tax cut, everything instinctively that you would think would make gold go up uh, has kind of had not much effect on it recently. Uh, from from its uh, peak in 2011, it's, it's really... You know, it's gotten to the point where it's really a boring, complacent market for the most part. You know, we have clients who have enormous positions in gold, very wealthy individual investors. And they always say, you know, in an ideal world, my gold doesn't rise in value because for gold to rise in value, everything else that I own has to probably be in bad shape. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so they see their gold as an insurance policy and, and they're quite content to not have have gold rise too sharply because the last uh, times, the last several times when gold has risen sharply, it's been a period of great agita in the in the global political and economic world. <laughs> oh yeah, that's for sure. So uh, so no news is uh, is good news for them. And the fear trade, I guess, anytime you buy anything out of fear, it's probably not going to turn out well over the long haul. Right. I mean, whether it's Bitcoin or whatever you might be buying, you know, you need a sound basis to be an investor. Otherwise, you're a speculator. Right. Yeah. If you're buying fear, you know, when the guy's running after you with the chainsaw, it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you buy gold, I mean, we, we tell them that investors say, why would I own gold? And the answer is for a variety of reasons. One of which is that um, you buy gold as insurance. You should have some gold as insurance against both global catastrophic uh, financial or political or economic problems and personal economic problems. So you should have some gold as an insurance or as a fear buy, but you should be buying it when the price is low, not when it's too late. Yeah. So the age old insurance policy, and we've seen that policy cashed in numerous times throughout history. Uh, People have held on to gold and really avoided avoided the uh, worst of these catastrophes that have happened. Well, we got to wrap up now, Jeff. So we find you website cpmgroup.com. Yes, cpmgroup.com. All right. And any questions, comments for Jeff, myself, email us kl at kerrylutz.com. That's the address. The Twitter feeds at Kerry Lutz. The Facebook page is Financial Survival Network. Jeff, we're going to be doing a webinar together in a couple of weeks. Or That's week what I half. understand. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll talk to you then. Thanks so much for coming on. You're welcome. It's good to be here. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.